Seattle celebrates the return of visitors and workers downtown as COVID restrictions ease. The memory of two special women inspires him to ride thousands of miles during a blitter ride. Please step to the rear of the sphere. It was a popular attraction at the Seattle World's Fair. So what happened to the bubbleator? These stories and more next on City Stream. I'm Enrique Cerna. Welcome to City Stream from Seattle Center. As we turn the corner on COVID, the city rolls out the welcome mat, encouraging people to support businesses hit hard by the pandemic. Make some noise! It's time for Seattle to reopen. We still have to be cautious, but we have made it through a really hard time, and it's time for us to reopen. one thing people can do is get vaccinated. We are over 80% vaccinated, 12 and above in the city of Seattle, which makes us a really safe place for businesses and workers. It's important for us to remember that a lot of these business owners have really been through a challenging period and that we have an opportunity to show up with compassion, to show up with grace and empathy and remind them that they're an important part of our communities. We'll take a look at another welcome back celebration in downtown Seattle a bit later. This photo was taken in 1962 at the Seattle World's Fair. I was nine years old, and my family and I came here to the fair to see what was going on. One of the things that we did was to ride the bubbleator. Now, the bubbleator used to be located right there where that elevator is here at the armory. Now, almost 60 years later, our Felix Benel is looking back at the World's Fair, and he's obsessed with the bubbleator. Here's Felix. It sometimes gets a little weird, you know, when the people are zeroing in on your house. You'd think by now that Gene Oxiger would be used to all the attention. A lot of people are kind of dumbstruck when they come. I'll answer the door and they're unable to express what they're here for. They're sitting there, uh, uh, uh. Maybe what they're trying to say is, Please step to the rear of the spear. How's that? Please step to the rear of the sphere. Please step to the rear of the sphere. Those eight immortal words were first uttered in 1962 to guide passengers aboard the Bubbleator, one of the signature attractions at the Seattle World's Fair. You better ski daddle to Seattle for the fair. Just ask Louis Larson. He was there on the ground floor. Yeah, it looked like a mess. The mess was the massive construction that transformed the sleepy part of Lower Queen Anne into the world of Century 21. Louis Larson is the last surviving senior staff member of the spectacle that changed Seattle and Louis Larson forever. Every day was exciting. I mean, uh, every day was like New Year's Eve. It was an experience that very, very few people would ever have in a lifetime. Met a lot of great people, had, a, had an enjoyable time. Wasn't a day I didn't want to go to work. 10 million people visited the futuristic fair from April to October 1962. The theme was Century 21. Imagine, if you can, an electronic brain operating at millionth of a second speed. And while the monorail and space needle remain visible as tangible reminders of what the future looked like 60 years ago, the bubbleator has moved on. Bubbleator was very popular. It was unique. It, you know, I, I think that was the whole thing. But that was in the Washington State Pavilion, which is with the uh, climate of uh, Arena coming up. What exactly was the bubbleator? Just a common everyday elevator? 
It is a bubble-shaped elevator that was in the uh, Washington State Coliseum, which we now know as Climate Pledge Arena. And it was a, a bubble-shaped elevator that people would go into and they would go to the second floor to experience a futuristic exhibit. Clara Berg is curator of collections at Mohai, Seattle's Museum of History and Industry, home since 2005 to the Bubbleator Operator's Chair. So we were able to purchase it uh, with some help from the community and have it come to Mohai. And it had a few modifications. There was some orange shag carpet on it and there were things that have been added. So uh, we tried to kind of take it back to as close as we, what we think uh, it was from the time. After the fair, the Bubbleator was moved across the fairgrounds to what's now called the Armory where it was used for nearly 20 years as, well, a common everyday elevator. In 1980, as part of a renovation project, the bubble later went away, which brings us back to where we started. Please step to the rear of the sphere. Please step to the rear of the sphere. Exactly. I believe that's what they call a meme. In 1983, Gene was working for the old Seattle PI newspaper. Legendary local journalist and future Seattle City Council member Gene Godden sent him on a reconnaissance mission to meet a man at a warehouse on the north side of Lake Union. The bubble eater was in a heap, literally. I mean, it was just plexiglass and, and uh, aluminum strewn all over the floor. Yeah, it looked like a mess. And he turned to me and he said, do you want it? You know, if you, if you want it, make me an offer. I made him an offer and he said, he says, no, nah, I can't let it go for that. <laughs> Two days later, I get a phone call back from him and he said, double your offer and get it out of here. So I ended up with a bubble later and it cost me $1,000. I was in the process of planning a house. You know, it was such a unique shape and it was a historical artifact. I thought it would make a great uh, greenhouse. Yes, that's a wonderful idea. Welcome to the bubble later. It's been cleaned out now, but this was a greenhouse and uh, hopefully soon it will be hosting a lot of plants again. Why do people still seek out the bubble later decades after it left town? It wasn't a common uh, everyday elevator. People fell in love with it. And it also, I think, was of the size that people could wrap their arms around the idea of, you know, this is something that's not too large. We look at the Space Needle and everything, you're not gonna be able to embrace the Space Needle the way you can something smaller like this. As for the future of the bubble later, Gene Oxiger says that not too long ago, Seattle Center officials asked him to consider donating it back. The main idea would be is to, you know, simply be able to preserve it, but also taking care of the fact that it is gonna leave a large hole in the house. But if that large hole at Gene's house could be fixed, it does open up at least one intriguing possibility at Seattle Center. Do you think they should bring the bubble later back to the climate No, arena? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think what they're doing is fantastic. There's only room for 100. Or should I just do it without the only just room? Just do the rear, rear of the okay. sphere. Step to the rear of the sphere. Yes, please, though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Please step to the rear of the sphere. On a rail of steel, a kiss from you. There'll be a festive there with the Seattle World's Fair. This summer of 62. Bring a lot of money. This summer of 62. Since the bubbleator itself is on private property, visiting the bubbleator operator chair at Mohai is the best way to learn more about this nostalgic artifact from the Seattle World's Fair. Next on City Stream, the memories that motivate this man to pedal thousands of miles to benefit cancer research. Right now, people across the region are pedaling, running, and walking to raise money for cancer research through a popular event known as Obliteride. Now in its ninth year, it's raised more than $32 million. One man who's shown uncommon dedication and determination for this cause is Greg Roth. Producer Chris Barnes explains why he rides. When I'm on my bike, I'm free. There's no COVID-19, there's no politics, there's none of it. 
there's just what's happening in the moment. There's just me, my bike, whatever I'm thinking about, whatever I'm feeling in nature. It's just that, that freedom. Cycling is freedom for me. So I guess in the cycling world, I mean, I've been an athlete my whole life. I've played soccer, tennis, baseball. And at this point in my life, I, I race and I do cycling events and I train probably about 250 miles a week on average. I ride for my mental, physical and spiritual health and to inspire others. You can participate in a sport or activity at a really high level beyond what your mind tells you you can do. And so I want to inspire people as they get older to be active and enter events. It could be cycling events, it could be running events, but I think the best part about doing events is a lot of them are, are related to raising money for charities. Out of all the events that I ride, the most important event is Fred Hutch Oblid Ride, which at its core is a cycling event consisting of between 1,000, 2,000 riders riding to honor those they love and to raise money for cancer research. Obliteride raises funds through our donor network. We really rely on our participants to reach out to donors, friends, family, co-workers, in order to raise funds for their efforts through Obliteride. Thank you, and have a great ride. Some of our biggest cheerleaders, such as Greg Roth, is one of the reasons why we're as successful as we are. Obliteride number five, 2020, COVID-19 edition, man. And then I didn't even know where I was. It's like, I just check, okay, how many miles I got? And then it's like, oh, I know where I am now, yay. So I rode my first Fred Hutch Blitter ride in 2016, and the reason I chose to ride it was in reaction to something that happened when I was 11. Here, let me back up and, and kind of go back to the beginning of the story. When I was 11 years old, my mom died of cancer. She was 31, and I watched her body deteriorate, you know, over the course of a few years. Her body was ravaged by radiation therapy. She had bone cancer. She would take a step and break her foot. The last summer of her life, she was probably in the hospital most of the summer before she came home to die. So, um, for me, doing Fred Hutch Blitteride was, was, I guess, a, a way to heal because for you know a lot of years, like I kind of buried it, you know. Using cycling to honor my mom and to do something positive in the community on behalf of my mother, so that mom's memory could live and that her death could be meaningful. I can't change the fact that she died, but I can do something positive from it. This has been a dream of mine to put a team together and do this, and you guys are all here. So after I blew ride 2016, I had met these two women, Jenny George and Ashley Berg. They were both young moms and both had dealt with cancer. Um, Jenny had cancer and, and, and won. Ashley, on the other hand, was right in the middle of the battle with stage four. So the first year I did Fred Hutch Blitter Ride, I rode 50 miles and I actually felt really good and felt like I could have gone longer. So the next year I said, I'm gonna do 100 miles. And instead of just writing for my mom, I thought it would be really cool to honor two other moms as well as my mom. And that's when I thought of Ashley and Jenny. And then I thought, wouldn't it be cool to document that experience in the form of a movie? So I've decided to do that. And along with Jason Tang, we've been working on this documentary for three years now. But the best part of the shots, the composition, was the way the light's hitting the water and then just the dusk and the way that the sun kind of just kisses the top of Mount Rainier and then you see the city in the background. That was from the shoot, the winter shoot, yeah. Yeah, but I also, I mean, my friends that are not going through cancer, I think that they're also, we're kind of getting more in that age where we don't go out as often. Yeah, so that's true. I don't know. It's when the cancer migrates to other parts of your body and the cancer wants to live and the cancer's smart, so when you remove the primary tumor, it will find a way to live somewhere else, and that's when it kills you. So we decided to make the film, and in the process of making the film, I got to interview Ashley and spend time with her. Mm -hmm. So after I had the chemo, then I went through daily radiation for six weeks. Mm -hmm. So going in every day, 
Um, my mom did that. Oh my gosh. We had deep conversations and you know, she opened up to me and I opened up to her and we just held nothing back. And, and through that process, I just fell in love with her. This film project became the most important thing I had and, and Ashley became the center of it. She died the day after Mother's Day on May 14th, 2018. She stayed alive long enough for her last Mother's Day. And she passed away at two in the morning. I bring these photos with me of Ashley and my mom. They look so much alike, but I bring them with me when I'm riding to keep them present in my heart. And I also feel that with the photos and I look at them that they're with me. And especially for events or special rides where I want that, you know, extra inspiration. Greg has done an incredible job of writing in the name of loved ones that he feels he needs to honor. And I am so grateful that Obliteride has given him this opportunity. When I'm out riding, I think of Ashley, my mom, all the time because I think of their struggle. If I'm up on a climb or a hill, it hurts, and, and I'm struggling to get to the top. But then I think about their struggle, like their day-to-day -day struggle. So yes, that inspires me. My mom was a real hero, and Ashley, she's a real hero. Greg Roth expects to log 3,000 miles by the time this year's Obliteride wraps up later this month. His documentary is set to debut sometime in 2022. Now, if you'd like to learn more, check out the website, weridewhy.com. Just ahead, another celebration welcomes everyone back to downtown. And as neighborhood farmers markets reopen, this tasty bite is a sample of what to expect. Welcome back to CityStream from Seattle Center. Businesses of all types and sizes are inviting the public back 17 months after COVID first struck this region. Seattle has marked the reopening with a series of welcome back weeks. Producer Andy Ng takes a look at the celebration at Westlake. economy but it's also about celebrating that we can be together again as a community. We haven't been able to gather to celebrate each other for a year and a half and we really want to give folks the opportunity to do that in person, maskless if they so choose. Well, kids missed Halloween during the pandemic. Obviously, trick-or-treating during that time was not going to be possible, so we really wanted to give kids and families their favorite holiday back. And I think you can see by the amount of people in costume, folks are really excited about it. Obviously, COVID affected all of our neighborhoods, but it had a really acute impact on downtown because so many of our downtown businesses rely on office workers and office workers working in person. So downtown had more than 450 street level businesses close. And at the height of the pandemic, foot traffic was just a quarter of what it was during pre-pandemic times. 
We're starting to see, you know, uh, the corner be turned. We have nearly 300 businesses that have now opened um, downtown, which is excellent. Obviously, foot traffic is increasing. Some workers are choosing to come back to the office. And our goal here with these really fun large-scale events is to bring more people downtown, not so they attend our events and then leave, but they stay in the area, support small businesses, and support our local arts and cultural institutions. A popular reopening has been the return of Seattle's neighborhood farmers markets. The markets allow small family farmers and food producers to sell directly to the public. One example, Ayako and family, a jam maker that preserves the legacy of Japanese family traditions. Producer Leila Kazmi explains. Do you want some jam? This is um, a little more tart and herbaceous. It's really good. You want to try a jar? OK. My name is Alessandra, and I am the owner and operator of Ayako and Family, which is a family jam business. We were founded by my mother, Ayako, in 2010. She was an immigrant who moved here at 30 years old to start a family and didn't have community here and cultivated something so beautiful. Food was a huge part of our daily life. My mother, just before we got home from school, she would spend, you know, four to five hours cooking dinner. Then my mom would often extend, you know, invitations to friends and neighbors. The jam came out of a tradition of going berry picking every summer with my mother and my grandmother, strawberries and raspberries, and that was actually the first jams that she would make at home, were berry jams. Um, and it wasn't until she met this farmer at the U District Farmer's Market in Katsumi Taki that she started producing stone fruit jams. He also emigrated here, and he really missed Japanese produce, and so he started growing that. They immediately bonded over that, just being nostalgic for Japanese food. Okay, two twenty high. Okay, two and perfect. One day he had a couple boxes of seconds, which are fruit that is slightly blemished, um, that couldn't be sold at full price. And he was like, oh, these got damaged on the way over. I'm going to have to compost these. And she was like, absolutely not. This is beautiful fruit. Um, she's like, give them to me. I'll see what I can do. And so I actually remember we went back to my apartment at the time, a little studio apartment, and we cooked our first batch of apricot jam uh, on my electric stove. Um, very humble beginnings and um, still use that method in that recipe today. My mom and I really did enjoy making food together. She always explained to me that it should be intuitive and coming from your heart, how you cook. When she became so ill that there just became a point where she said, I can't do this anymore. Do you want to make this jam? And I came to the realization that the business was so important to me because of how important it was to her. My mother worked so hard and built something with the intention of just focusing on her community and her heritage and then her ingredients. Now that she's passed, I really wanted to continue that for her. For the last 10 years, we've been wholesaling to various retailers around the city. I took over a couple years ago, at which point um, we started vending at farmer's markets, and I also started producing a Japanese style of bread called shokuhan. I make the jams at a commercial kitchen space. It's called Kitchen Sisters on Lower Queen Anne, and it's a shared space. We usually get about 50 to 100 pounds of rhubarb every week while it's in season. The recipe that we'll be using today is a recipe that I inherited from my mother. So I have the raw rhubarb, so we'll be washing the rhubarb and then, you know, basically cutting it into smaller pieces. And then we will cook the rhubarb with sugar. and reduce it down until it's ready to be canned. 
Japanese food is all about simplicity and honesty. What I really love about what my mom did was that she took something incredibly humble and simple and just honed it and honed it and honed it. That is very uniquely Japanese, is like taking something and perfecting it and just focusing on, you know, the one thing. It's in our ethos and our mission to source thoughtfully um, and sustainably, um, working with primarily you know, one Japanese farmer um, using Asian varieties. My favorite part are the farmer's markets because that's when I get to share this food with people. Even my mom used to say, you know, my favorite part is watching someone take that first bite of jam. That's amazing. <laughs> it's a simple act. It's a really simple food. But I love being a part of that kind of daily food ritual. We can cook all day long and sell all the jam in the world, but it's really nothing unless we can sort of share in that experience. And that's why I love the market. It's, you know, it's a wonderful community of like-minded individuals who are producing food around the same values. Some jam? Yay, apricot. Thank you so much. Yummy. Thank you, Justin. See ya. I think about my mother all the time when I'm making jam or when I'm at the market. She's pretty much always in the forefront of my mind. She was a, a very familiar face at the market. She loved it. That was her dream. You know, she wanted a place where people could come and visit her and eat her food. There you are, my dear. Enjoy. Have a good day. I'll see you soon. Okay, I'll see you next week. Bye. You can find Ayako and Family Jams at the U District and Ballard Farmers Markets, and also at select stores in the Seattle area. We'll be right back. That's all for this edition of City Stream from Seattle Center. Now, if you'd like to see some of the great programming on the Seattle Channel, just go to seattlechannel.org and click on Feature Shows. I'm Enrique Cerna. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.